Um, it really is, you know, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and especially in a, in a format like this. Um, you know, archaeologists and professors and all that stuff, you know, are all used to sitting in a dark room, showing slides and telling people what we know, because we're the experts, right? Well, and that's what makes this special is that no. So stop me anytime, and we will have questions and answers afterwards. Um, but it's informal. Stop me anytime you want. Um, I'm always happy to, to answer questions. Um, so the title is something like early Navajos, tree rings, tree rings, early Navajos, and warfare in the Dineta. So I try and work backwards in that sort of parse that sentence. If you remember, we're all old enough to know what parsing a sentence meant. You know? <laughs> um, so starting off, off with Dineta, and there were something I sent to, to Kate and Doug, but I'm not sure it ever made it because they had other things to do. Um, other more important things to do. Um, Dineta literally um, it's a Navajo word and what it means is among the Diné. The Diné is Diné, D-I-N-E, accent something. Um, in French it's an accent grave, but I don't think the Navajos speak all that much French. Um, the Diné means the people. It, it's, it's the Navajo people. Um, and Ta means among. So when you see places, if you're up there driving around the Navajo Nation, which is northeastern Arizona, northwestern New Mexico, you'll see places, place names, street, you know, signs on the highway that say Biklabata or all sorts of, you know, lots of things ending in Nakaibato, um, lots of things ending in Ta. And that means among. So Dineta means among the people. And in Navajo terms, that is the ancestral Navajo, that's the heart of the ancestral Navajo homeland, the heart of the Navajo people. That's where they have always been. <laughs> and in archaeological terms um, and historical terms, that's this area of northwestern New Mexico um, between somewhere southeast of Farmington, New Mexico, if you know where Farmington is, a little bit east of there. It's actually not part of the Navajo Nation today, which is an interesting historical development. Um, that I'll talk about as part of this archaeology, but the, um, the Navajo Nation ends, depending on checkerboardy sort of land use things, somewhere in the San Juan Basin, and this is east of the San Juan Basin, so it's east, east southeast of Farmington, kind of north of Cuba, New Mexico, Cuba, um, which are if you're ever in Cuba, Bruno's, El Bruno's. One of the best, best restaurants in the Southwest. Some people I know have been there. Um, and kind of certainly west of Chama, west of the Continental Divide. And the northern boundary is a little fuzzy. But so that's Dineta. Um, and there are a group of, well, all of the earliest Navajo sites ever identified are in that area, whatever, however we sort of define it, and it gets defined in different ways um, by different people and different groups. Um, but all of the earliest Navajo archaeological sites are in that area. And beginning, the earliest absolutely well dated and by well-dated, I mean tree-ring-dated, um, and we'll talk about that. 
too. Um, the er absolute earliest well-dated tree ring site is 1540. Um, but after that, we have groups of tree ring dated sites. They're, they're all in that area. And once you get out of that area, nothing really dates even into the, some of them up in northern Arizona around Black Mesa, north of the Hopi Mesas things, date to the early, some of them the early 1700s, but not much. Mostly that's a, a 19th century, late 18th century occupation up there. But what I really want to talk about and what I've worked on for a long time is the, um, this group of sites in Dineta called Pueblitos. And they're just, just like the name sounds, um, little Pueblos. They're, ma they're masonry stone, masonry mud, three to four room, usually five room sort of structures, although there are probably, I think about it, three or four of them uh, that will have as many as 25 rooms. So they're not all Pueblitos. They're certainly smaller than Pueblos, Hopi Pueblos, Pueblos in the Rio Grande Valley, things like that. But they're these small, relatively small structures that are located often on the tops of boulders, on the rims of mesas, Often, but not always. And that's one of the key things that I'm dealing with. Um, so that usually they have, when you're in one of these things, they can see a long ways. Like, you know, miles, up and down canyons, across valleys, things like that. Um, and they're really visible on the archaeological landscape. That's one of the other important things is that when archaeologists first looked at these and somebody, you all, I know, I know several of you and a bunch of you and, and we'll meet more of you later, you know the name of Alfred Vincent Kidder. Um, A.V. Kidder, first PhD in American archaeology. Um, Kidder looked at these sites and this wasn't his big interest. Um, he was over in Pecos. Um, but in 1920, he looked at a bunch of these and said, hmm, they are these masonry structures. The ceramics look Navajo, but there's some Pueblo ceramics on them. They're next to Hogans, which fork pole Hogans, which are a very traditional Navajo dwelling type, which was used into the 1960s on Black Mesa. And we, we have a direct historical connection with Hogans and Navajos. Navajos still build Hogans today. Most people don't live in them. Um, but up until the 1960s in some places, Navajos did. So you have these two structure types. And, and Kidder said, looks to me like Puebloan folks moved in with Navajos and built these Pueblitos. So when might that have happened? And from a number of sort of sources of evidence, inferences, Kidder posed the hypothesis that he said, well, I think these are probably, these Pueblitos are built by refugees from the Rio Grande Valley, Puebloan people, Tewas, Towas, people who are not Navajo, move up there to escape the Spanish. After the Great Pueblo Revolt, of the Great Pueblo Revolt of 1680, the Spaniards get driven out of New Mexico. The only time, and this is something I just, it's, it, it's incredibly important, the only time in, well, I can't say world history, but I know in the New World where native populations defeated a European power 
and made them retreat. The Spaniards in 1680 retreat down to El Paso. They abandoned, they gave up all of New Mexico. Well, 12 years later, they come back, um, and Kidder posited that this is such a disruptive time, um, people, that people living in the Pueblos in the Rio Grande Valley abandon those Pueblos, fearful of Spanish retribution, move up into the Navajo um, country and build these Pueblitos. So that's sort of the, the background of all of this. And that's where I started, oh, when I was a graduate student at the Tree Ring Lab, lo, these many years ago and decades or something like that. And that was kind of the model. And there were a few tree ring dates associated that sort of supported that model. Um, there'd been, you know, sort of haphazard collections going on since Kidder's day, well, shortly after Kidder's time. Um, but a couple of the tree ring samples that, I don't know if you guys have heard or read this famous story, but when Andrew Ellicott Douglas bridged the gap and developed a long tree ring chronology in the southwest, there were actually a couple of these samples from Pueblitos that played a role in that. Not a fabulous role, but so we have these, there have been samples out of these structures for, you know, being collected for 70 years when I started. And like most things, through a number of serendipitous occurrences and chance meetings and all sorts of things, friendships that you develop 15 years ago just on a whim that all of a sudden you meet somebody else and this and that. Um, I got heavily involved in this and have been sampling those structures for almost the last 20 years. You know, I was out last fall sampling more of these Pueblitos. And it turns out that not only are there a lot more of them than we ever thought. You know, after the second year I did this, I'm figuring I'm about done with my dissertation now. I got enough data to, I finished that thing and I got, I got other things to do. And I told a friend of mine in Farmington, the BLM archeologist, I said, well, I've gotten all the ones with good wood. <laughs> and he said, well, well, we'll see about that. I still, we still, he found another one last fall that I have to go up and sample this summer. So it just keeps building. <laughs> but so I've now, we've now sampled more than 160 of these Pueblito sites. When initially we thought, ah, oh, there's like 15 to 20 of these that, you know, they're the, the refugee Pueblitos where people moved up from the river. And we now have more or less, I was, I have a student working on this, almost 2,000 tree ring samples from these things, and almost 1,200 dates. And the dates mean different things in different contexts, but the, the overarching idea <laughs> or theory now is that there is one of these 130 Pueblitos that was probably built, it's built in 1694. Actually, there's really no question about that. It was built probably between August of 1694 and the end of September of 1694, which actually, and we can I can talk about tree rings, we can get into that later, but um, which really is wonderful. It coincides incredibly well because during the reconquest, starting July 31st of 1694, Don Diego de Vargas attacked Jemez Pueblo and leveled it, burned it to the ground. So there's a real temporal connection there with Jemez people moving up. And that Pueblito doesn't look like any of the others either. It looks like a Pueblo. It's not on a boulder, it's not on a mesa ram, it's a square 
And it's four rooms about as big as this area here. The rest of them, the other 129 or whatever number we have now, fall into very different groups. And there's one cluster in the stuff I did this fall that we just got done dating it. Again, it's the same pattern. Beginning in about 1708, 1710, 1712, sometime in that period, we get a bunch of these Pueblitos that are built on boulders or they're really very hidden. So there'll be little rock shelters hidden somewhere. And they're absolutely contemporaneous. There's, you know, I'd have to look up the numbers, but there's probably 25 of them that really fit that. So they're, they're either really inaccessible up, up on the tops of these pinnacles. And imagine, we don't have anything around this, but imagine something on top of Finger Rock in, in the Catalinas, you know, something like that. Not that dramatic, but something high. Or really hidden behind cliffs and things like that. So that's one group. And they're kind of spread all over Dineta. One of the things I'm working on in that group, um, or my explanation for that group, is that we have, finally after I started my dissertation, um, and so sometime in the mid 90s, people got more historic documents. <clears throat> and we got a, a diary from a man, well, I'm not sure it was his diary, you know how the Spaniards operated in that time frame. Um, but Roque de Madrid, one of the maestros de campo in Santa Fe, <coughs> excuse me, at the time, in 1705, led an invasion of Dineta. And there's no other way to describe it. It was an invasion. Like most Spanish entradas, he had a couple of hundred conquistadores, he had 300 Indian auxiliaries, he had livestock, he had horses. This was an army invading Dineta. They wanted to, quote, punish the Navajos for raiding the Pueblos, Pueblon areas, and all of a sudden in Dineta, shortly thereafter, you see lots of these Pueblitos popping up on the landscape. They needed to be able to see these entradas, and those entradas continued for about 10 years. Um, and there are reasons for that, but they, um, so the Spaniards, Another thing to keep in mind is that 1600s, especially after the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, and into the 1700s, into, boy, certainly the early 1800s, the Southwest was a pretty violent place. Lots of people were attacking, raiding, other people, but they're also trading with other people. It, it, I think it kind of depended on the week, the season, the, and the individual groups. We want to talk about, you know, Navajos or Puebloans or something, but most societies, and certainly Navajo society at that time, is operated on family lines, organized along family lines. So my family doesn't like your family. I don't care what their family says. <laughs> So I'm gonna, so that was part of this whole deal. So we have this, these Pueblitos early being built in these really inaccessible places or very hidden. And I think in response to Spanish invasions, because these happened, we don't have all the diaries, unfortunately. Hopefully more come to light in Seville or um, Madrid or Monterey, places like that. Um, 
that we can find them. We know they lasted until about 1715 or 16, but we only have this one diary from 1705. If we look at the tree ring dates, though, you have this big group built, yeah, but in the late 1708 through 1713, something like that. And then you don't have any being built very much. You've got a few, and some of the big ones grow and add a few rooms, like a family's growing or you know, a group of an extended family is getting bigger. And beginning about 1725, you get this huge influx, or huge construction, and not influx, um, of the 130 Pueblitos that we've dated well. There are probably between 17 25 and 17, say 45, there's probably 80 of them that get built during that time period. So this, and especially in the late, mid to late 1720s, boom, 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 boom. Every rock on the landscape out there, I think, had a Pueblito. Only two rooms, three rooms, something like that. Most of them, people weren't living in. If we look at the, the middens, look at the, um, numbers of ceramics, numbers of tools and things. I get frustrated when I go on some of these and archeological surveys, it's like, oh, there's 13 sherds and four lithics and two pieces of ground stone. How long were people living there? Well, you, you use more than two pieces of ground stone in, what, a week? You know, so it's just not, so there's not a lot of stuff. People aren't living in these things, necessarily. There's probably a few that they are. Um, but this huge scattering of construction in this period. They're all small. There's still Hogans. There's lots and lots of Hogans out there, which is something I'm working on now, um, where people were living in these things. Sometimes they're around Pueblito, sometimes they're not. Um, well. The historic documents then provide us with this idea that, gee, sometime after 1716, the Spaniards in the Rio Grande Valley, who were dirt poor, don't, don't ever kid yourself that you know these are Europeans, therefore they're wealthier than the Native Americans who are around, no. The Spaniards in the Rio Grande Valley were dirt poor, the crown, <clears throat> their nearest connection to the Spanish Empire was Mexico City. That's 1,500 miles by foot. And the people in Mexico City had to talk to the people across the ocean before they could give you money to do something that they didn't care about 1,500 miles up there in the middle of nowhere. So the people in the Rio, Spaniards in the Rio Grande Valley are really dirt poor. And one of the other consequences, probably the most significant consequence of the Great Pueblo Revolt of 1680 in big broad terms, it was important for the local people, it freed up a tremendous number of horses. The Spaniards had introduced horses into the Southwest, into the New World, with the conquest, and they kept control of them for almost 100 years, 80 years. With the revolt and the Spaniards retreating to El Paso, many of those horses they lost control of. Those horses and the Puebloan people who had herded those horses learned how to breed those horses. Those horses became a sign of wealth and if you look across the entire western U.S., after 1680, the horse spreads. You all remember Dances with Wolves, the movie. The Sioux were foot hunters of bison before the Pueblo Revolt. By the mid-1700s, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, all the big plains tribes that you see in western movies 
they got their horses because of the Pueblo Revolt. So the other part about that, one of those other groups was the Ute in Colorado, the Ute and Comanche. And the Comanche moved down the plains of Colorado and they start raiding Spanish settlements along the Rio Grande and the upper Rio Grande, um, along the Galisteo Basin, um, San Jose, San Jose del Vado, um, even attacking Abiquiu. So the Spaniards essentially sign, not really sign, but develop a peace treaty with the Navajos because they don't want to be fighting the Navajos because there's these other people out there on the plains that are attacking Spanish settlements, Spanish outliers. Those same people on horses out there on the plains also start raiding Navajo settlements. And what are they after? They're not after sheep or corn. Navajos didn't have any sheep at that time, but what they're really after is children. Well, two things. Children who made great slaves in the households of the Rio Grande Valley, great, ho great household servants. And there's a reference, a couple of references, so it's not just one. But that at the trade fair in Taos, a Navajo child brought three horses. Boy, if you're into horses and you're into horse culture, three horses for one 12-year-old boy or girl the other part, adults, were, and there's Apaches as well as Navajos and, and other, and remember, oh, everybody's doing this to everybody else. Um, many adults are getting shipped to the silver mines in Zacatecas. They're getting shipped far south because the silver mines are running out of labor, Indian labor in Mexico, by the early to mid 1700s. Um, so, so there's this real incentive for these. So my explanation is that um, all of those Pueblitos built in the, between 1725 and 1745 that are popping up on these rocks that nobody's really living in. There's a few, there's evidence of being there, ceramics and things. It's places to hide, places to put the kids. Because if somebody's on a horse and wants to raid your village, they're not going to get off their horse to climb up this, on top of this boulder, because then they lose all the advantage of being a raider. They, they're all said they've got to have somebody watch the horses. And if that person gets lost, all of a sudden they're, you're there without your horse, and you know, you're, you're in big trouble then. So that was, that's sort of my explanation for this middle period. And then Dineta, the absolute latest tree ring dates we have from any Pueblito in Dineta are 1755. So it's a very short-lived thing. And we've got, mm, there's probably like 15 or 16 sites, really four or five important, really big sites Pueblitos that date between 1745 and 1750. And they're big, 20, 30 rooms. Two of them have walls around them, like this, you know, stone walls all the way around the thing. What I think happened, and I'm still looking, there's some support in the historic documents for this. Um, something really fundamental, there was some fundamental change in the late 1740s. Yes, there was a big drought in 1748, but, you know, I'm a tree ring person. I don't really believe that climate drives people to do things, even though everyone else in my tree ring lab says, oh, climate caused this, climate caused that. Oh, yeah, people are human beings. Climate plays a role, but no. And there are people living up there, and one of the things I think happened was a real fundamental change in the nature of warfare. And I'm trying to, we know in 1753, 
in the historic documents, then some of these you always have to take with a grain of salt or at least evaluate. Um, the Spanish documents suggest that a thousand warriors attacked Abiquiu. The town of Abiquiu, Georgia O'Keeffe, that's where, that's where you've heard the name Abiquiu before. That's a real change from, you know, six or eight folks riding through your camp and stealing a kid. A thousand mounted warriors attacking a Spanish town, not just a Navajo village, but a walled span. Abiquiu was walled by that time. So, and I'm not sure what's driving that thing, that there's, and so by 1755, the Navajos in Dineta, now there are other Navajos who've been moving out of Dineta for a while. Um, I think the last Navajos for that period anyway in Dineta, you know, 1755, they turned out the lights and said, we're out of here, and what they did is took, and that's when they really transformed themselves into a sheep herding economy. And by 1800, they're the most famous weavers in the Southwest. You all see Navajo rugs. There's a picture from Bent's Fort, one of the early photographs of Bent's Fort, and I think it's 1850-ish, picture of a Cheyenne encampment. 100 Cheyenne people, every one of them was wearing a Navajo blanket. Because <laughs> the Navajos bought into the sheep economy, because sheep were also mobile. You know, cornfields, somebody can come in and raid and burn the cornfields. And you go hungry. Sheep, you can move sheep around. And, and I defy anyone out there to, who is inexperienced herding sheep to come in and raid and steal your sheep. If you've ever tried to herd sheep without sheep dogs and knowledge, you're, you're chasing marbles on a tabletop. And that's, you might get one sheep for all your effort. That's it. So that's kind of, I'll take questions. That's kind of the summary of anything I've got for that time period. And remember, I guess one of the important things is what tree rings have allowed us to do and look at this. If I were depending on ceramics, that period from 1680 to 1750, 1755, would all be one. It would be schmooged together. I couldn't, the ceramics don't change in that 60 or 70 year period. They just don't. Especially Navajo ceramics, they're gray. And then there's some gubernatorial polychrome, which is nice, but it looks the same from one end of the period to the other. So without, and the, if I do radiocarbon dates on these, a radiocarbon date from Navajo site in six, that was built in 1725, we'll say 1725 plus or minus 50. Same thing, we don't have the, the resolution that the tree ring dates have given us. So that's why I'm lucky to be where I am too. Sure. Just one, could you hold on for can oh, I get you the on. microphone? Bill, Bill needs to get a. I can do a microphone. Is that scary or what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you were talking about the time period where it's obvious that a lot of, of Navajos went to the run chutos. I'm guessing. I can't, you got to talk in. I can't. Okay. Um, I'm guessing that that means that you must have plenty of other dates. From other places? The time period. We're just talking about the period when they were um, moving. Time period when you were thinking that the ranchitos were the places where they might take their kids to to keep them safe. The pueblitos, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So that also supposes that there are real cities or real towns where they stayed otherwise. I'm assuming you have um, dates for that? Yeah. Um, cities and towns is probably the wrong term. Um, Hogan villages, and what those are really one, maybe two extended families. Navajos throughout history, one of the great terms to always remember is my Hogan and my nuclear family, there's my extended family, and it's matrilineal, matrilocal, so 
mom is here, daughter one is over there, daughter two is over there. You live within shouting distance. Because you, you don't want those people next to you. You don't want them vid visiting too often either. You want to be able to... So these problitos are places that I think, yeah, people could go to, but the, the settlement pattern is still dispersed. So from here to Bill's new office, that would be a large, but there might be 15, 20 hogans in that, what is it, maybe a mile? Yeah, it's about a mile. About a mile. So it might be 15, 20 hogans. Then everybody in that area is related. They're all nuclear families, a couple of extended families. And yeah, you can, it's within shouting distance. So you need something or, you know, hey, Bill, you want to, you know, go out today? It's, you know, so it's not, and we do have, we do have events for that. Um, <clears throat> I'm in the process of dating many more Hogan. I started out with just Pueblitos, but now I collect a lot more samples from Hogan's. Sure. You've, um, uh, you've said where the um, uh, horses came from, but you didn't tell us where the sheep came from, and maybe everybody but me knows where they came from, but I don't. Sheep were introduced into the Southwest by the Spaniards. Um, the first group came up with Coronado in 1540. Um, Coronado's invasion of the Southwest had at least a thousand head of livestock um, of various kinds, cattle, sheep, horses. Um, in 1598, so that's 1540, 1598, um, Don Juan de Oñate led a group not of, not an invasion, uh, still an invasion, but not not of conquistadores, he led a group of colonists to New Mexico. They founded first at, at um, San Juan, but then moved across the river and founded Santa Fe. So that's 1598. They founded Santa Fe in 1610. They had sheep. They hired, they, and they were there to stay. That's one of the other things. They were, they were colonists. They got a they got a commission from the Spanish crown to settle New Mexico. So they introduced sheep, and they're a special breed of sheep, actually, that the Navajo Nation now is trying to encourage um, and revitalize the churro sheep, um, which have a different kind of wool and a different, you know, all sorts of different behavioral things. Um, but as the Spaniards had people hired and forced and slaves and all sorts of things to herd these sheep. Those people learned about how to herd sheep. So they developed herds in the Rio Grande Valley and, you know, over a period of 150 years or more, the Navajos acquired sheep and the, and the technology and the talents to herd sheep. Tanatas, the other thing about it, it's not very good sheep country. It's very broken. It's a it's basically a big flat mesa that's been cut by all sorts of drainages. So it's flat until you want to cross a drainage and then it's straight down three, four, five hundred feet. So it's, you can only go north-south, you really can't go east-west. And that's bad for sheep. So when they move to the San Juan Basin, that's where you have, you know, big plains for miles and miles with lots of grass that sheep love. Bruce? Thank you. Um, you mentioned, I have probably a two or three part question, so I can ask them one at a time <laughs> all at once. You said the earliest dates that you had in the Dinatab were about 1540, then those were Hogans. Yes. Okay. Um, I read an article, or I was reading something recently, a few months ago, and it referred to an article. I think this was done within the last 10 years or so, and it was talking about someone who had been surveying, I believe, in the San Juan Basin and was finding sites that were at the Baskin that were structures that appeared to be pre-fork stick hogans, and he was saying, or the illusion was that um, they were getting much 
better at recognizing these sites. They were finding a lot more of them, and they seemed to be earlier than this, uh, an earlier period. So two, two questions okay. based on this, if you know whose article I'm talking about, and if you do, if you could mention the name. But is, is the 1540 era a, sort of a, a basal horizon that you're finding a lot of fork stick hogans at that period and nothing before? And if that is the case, are you familiar with what I was referring to with these kind of pre-hogan sites? Um, first off, the 1540, that's, that's two structures. The next, and these are absolute, these are tree ring cutting dates. So they are absolute well dated. Um, the, the next group of clusters and hogans with cutting dates are in the late 1590s. My personal feeling is that I think the Navajos are there by the early 1400s. If we, and the sites you're talking about, and one of the issues with them, and I'm trying, I'll get to the person in a second, um, but they are, um, they're not well dated. They're dated with radial carbon dates, generally, because TL dating doesn't work up there very well, it sort of works. Archaeomagnetic dating doesn't work at all because the cars don't fire hot enough. Um, and, so in Donetto, I've got, we got radiocarbon dates that go back into the 1200s. Now, I think those radiocarbon dates are dead wood. They're old, old wood. I don't think they, they don't date the firing of this hearth. So, so that's that. Um, boy, there's, you know, there's a 1990 article in Kiva by John Reed, or Alan Reed and John Horn that talks about one of these sites in the San Juan Basin. There's an earlier article by Mike Marshall, 1985, in some report somewhere that has one of those sites. Um, my feeling on those things is they could be, but they're just not well dated. And you get out there in the San Juan Basin, they're really not going to build fork stick hoguns because there are no fork sticks out there. There are no trees out there. It's you know. It's, yeah, sagebrush. Build your house out of, you know, big sagebrush. So. And Bruce has <laughs> got his follow-up here. Just, just, <laughs> last, just last, one last quick one. Um, so would you put your, your best guess at arrival of Athabascans in that area is around the early 1400s? That's, yeah, and there's probably reasons, but it really is a guess. <clears throat> you know, I don't have, you know, solid evidence to back that up other than, you know, climate and ideas and things like that. Sir? Sure. The uh, Pueblitos to me suggests uh, a blending of culture perhaps with the uh, Pueblo uprising and then the reconquest causing the collapse of at least family groups if not uh, settlements and perhaps Navajo and Puebloans uh, joining together. Do you think that that's true? Um, in part, sure. Um, one of the, the, the early Kidder's arguments, um, which is what I have disagreed with, is suggesting that there's this massive influx after the reconquest or after the revolt. Because the Pueblitos don't, temporarily, they don't fit that. Um, on the other hand, there's clearly no doubt that Navajos, Athabascans, Navajos, Puebloans, people from Jemez, people from Santa Clara, started to interact as soon as people got into the South, as soon as Athabascans got into the Southwest. You know, I think, um, yeah, I think by the early 1600s, there are Puebloans moving in with Navajos. There are Navajos, I don't know that many Navajos, there's not much evidence in the ethnographic literature that they moved in to Pueblos, 
But there's certainly evidence that, well, the founding clan, several Navajo clans, are founded by Puebloan women. It takes one woman to found a clan. The Coyote Pass, Coyote Pass clan is founded by a Hemis woman. She was a slave, she was captured in a slave raid. But the, so there's been, yeah, lots of interaction there. Um, my argument is, is it's not a, a refugee situation like I used to, 10 years ago I could make this argument that this is not Kosovo. People are, are interacting over a period of 70, 80 years and you know, developing. Could, could I just sure. ask uh, one quick question? The, I've only been to a few of these pueblitos, but could you give people an idea of where they might go to visit? I'm seeing these places uh, on the ground. Uh, so are there places oh. that are easy public access to visit a pueblito? They, there are, sort of, in terms of easy access. Um, boy, the BLM used to give away a map with 10 of these sites on them, and I'm not sure if they still do, because the tribe, the Navajo Nation, I think got a little testy about that. Um, most of them are boy, somewhat easy to see on the landscape. Um, a bunch of them take a little bit of hiking, but the real trick out in that part of the world is, is it going to rain or has it rained or snowed? Because I've actually tried to lead at least two field trips with the Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society. Oh, I haven't done this in years, but I think we tried to do that twice, and it was monsoon season, and both times you got out there and said, mm, we can either all get stuck in the mud or we can turn back. So, um, I mean, I can give people, you know, some generalized maps, but the roads are, the roads are dirt. And so this time of year is, well, June is great, and October is great. In between, it could be great or not. No. Yeah, my question is, I realize that uh, situation from 1700 to 1800 was fluid, but was it in general most of the time the Navajos running and hiding, being afraid of the Spanish and the Plains Indians attacking the Spanish and the Navajos? And at times they were in alliance, the, the Navajos and the, and the Spanish? Or how in general would you characterize <laughs> that period, even though it changed as? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Um, it changed all the time. Well, and I, yeah. Um, you know, I think that early part, the, the early 1700s, that's when the Navajos and the Spanish were really much more in conflict. But after that, it becomes Utes and Comanches much more a threat to both of those people. Not that the, you know, not that the Navajos ever had a formal alliance with the Spaniards. Yeah. Um, but it was sort of more of an agreement of, we're not gonna invade you and we're not gonna raid you, except, you know, my cousin decided he wanted to raid you last week and, so, you know. Um, so that, and it, you know, again, by the mid-1750s, um, I don't know what changed economically, climatic, climatically, there were, climatically, one of the things that went on is, is both rainfall and temperature were incredibly variable. So you'd have cold, dry years followed by warm, wet years followed by, you know, cold, wet years. So agricultural productivity and predictability was probably weighed on everybody's mind. Um, but by 1750 or 60, I don't know what happened. Something weird happened out there on the landscape to everybody. And I don't know what it is. Sure. My question sort of follows up on that. Have you looked into uh, Navajo oral history and does any of it, if you have, collaborate what you were talking about, particularly oh. the, in the later period? Yeah, oh yeah. Um, several, um, and people are working on this, and that's something I like to participate in a lot. Um, 
but one of the most famous stories um, that was collected by Rich and, Richard Van Falkenberg in the 1930s um, talks exactly about um, this incredible battle um, with the Utes. And it was, I think I've identified this site where it happened, other people disagree with him. Um, but it's, it was told to him by a, a woman who gave a time frame that puts it in this and talks about this guy who was the chief of all the Navajo, got intelligence, if you were, of a Ute raiding party coming down across the San Juan River. And so they, the Navajos retreated to this Pueblito and the Utes attacked and the battle lasted 12 days and the Utes were driven back north of the San Juan River and for years afterwards, and this, this is where I think it gets weird too, medicine men used the Ute bones in ceremonies. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Only witches would do that. But um, So anyway, it, there is, and there are a number of those sorts of stories um, of none of them relating to Spanish attacks that I know of on Pueblitos. Um, so a little unrelated. Um, I've been on the trail to Cape Solitude lately, and there are some Holdens out there. And I was wondering if you routinely dated any of those up there. Because I'm curious to see how old the Hogan was that I was looking at. Do you have to? Cape Solitude near the canyon. It's on the east rim. Uh, east rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, okay. Um, kind of kind of depends on. I don't know that we've dated those specifically, although. It's entirely possible. Um, and it kind of depends on who you talk to. Um, the tree ring dates suggest Navajos moving into that area after 1750. Um, a couple of my good friends, and this was in a book that I edited years ago, um, as part of a big study up there, will argue that the Navajos we're in the Grand Canyon by the 1500s. Um, yeah, um, that's based on Navajo oral traditions and a number of other things, ceramic sort of things. Um, but yeah, in terms of tree ring dates, um, most of those are, yeah, I, I'd have to see them. If you give me an exact location, I can probably look it up tomorrow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> As a real novice, what exactly do you do when you go into one of these to do the uh, tree ringing? Do you slice off an end of one of the uh, uh, beams <laughs> running across the top? Or do you drill a small hole into it? Or what is the procedure? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. All, of the, all of the above. All of the above. Usually, well, it's particularly for sites where those beams are in place. Um, some of the early stuff that yeah, Andrew Alcott Douglas did and the Navajo lands claim people in the 1930s and 40s and 50s hired by the tribe would saw the ends off of beams. And we still have those samples in the triggering lab at, at the university. Um, we don't throw anything away. We keep all of those. Um, and since we're the only place, certainly in the western U.S., that does this, Everybody sends their stuff to us, and we keep it all. Um, so we've got all that. When I go out and I'm doing this, um, for the most part, yeah, we have a special, specially designed equipment. I have a battery-operated drill, a DeWalt, DeWalt 18-volt battery, and a drill bit that's essentially an elongated hole saw. So it's about six inches long, and I can take a, a core that's you know, all five eighths of an inch in diameter, um, and get it out, and it's still got all the rings on it. So we take it back to the lab and sand it up and spend hours looking at it under a microscope, and hopefully it tells us something. Not all of them do, that's the, the other part. But yeah, that's basically the technique. Ron, you mentioned that there was 
so I think it was 1748, may, may have been the, a drought year. Are, are there any other climatic um, variations over this time span that you think um, your, at least your colleagues might pay attention to? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the 1730s were a little bit dry, but not terribly. I mean, there are some, there are some real dry years. Um, in the Southwest, that's not really uncommon, you know? If, if five years out of the last 10 haven't been wet or dry or something in between, you know, when we say something is normal, you know, we used to think, yeah, what's normal? And when we look back, one of the things about Tucson and the Southwest in general, looking at all the tree ring data, um, since the mid-1970s 19, mid through the late 1990s, were the wettest 20 years in, you know, 30, 40, 50, well, in the 20th century and, and probably since the early 1600s. So what we look at now as a drought is probably more normal than the late 1980s. So looking at that period from 17, 1680 to 1750, so lots of variation. Um, <clears throat> in terms of drought, I don't think so. There are individual years. There are no real big, long droughts. Temperature is more important. Matt Salzer's work uh, reconstructing temperature, it really shows just incredible variability. Whereas other times you'd have, you know, 15, 20 years of above average or below average. The 1700s are really marked by extreme swings all the time. You know, every three years it's a drought or a flood or a you know freeze or a hot. So that to me, I think, is people can't adapt to that. If you can't, if you can say it's going to be dry, you can deal with that. We're in the middle of a drought. We can deal with that. We're in the middle of a really rainy period. But if you don't know, it's the unpredictability that I think is, is much more important than, not that they could predict the weather, but just adapting to it. But you're saying the unpredictability is more normal. Mm, possibly, yeah. <laughs> Again, I don't know. Um, it's harder to deal with, you know? But it's more likely. Yeah, that's, that's entirely possible, yeah. With, with doing what you do, you work with climates and studies of climates a lot? Maybe. I don't. A lot of my colleagues do. Um, I don't deal with it that much. I, I, I'm curious as to what your opinion of the global warming situation is. Do you see this as just a, another blip, or, or do you see it as something different than what has happened in the past? Um, that's actually, there's a two-part question. The tree ring data clearly show that it's not normal, that it's different than anything we've seen, certainly in the past thousand years, probably a lot longer. My argument with my colleagues is that's why we're human. We've dealt with this. That's what's made us human, is we've dealt with these sorts of changes since we became human. You know? and. We're not trees. Trees, and we see this in the tree ring record, um, you can see that in, say, at the end of the Pleistocene 10,000 years ago, tree line in the White Mountains of California was much lower because it was much colder. It got warmer, trees moved up. It got colder, trees moved down in response to you know, temperature. Yeah, but humans aren't trees. <laughs> you know, we can move sideways too. <laughs> we can jump up and down. We can, you know, we can do all sorts of other things. Um, Is there one last question for tonight? Ron, thank you very much. This is incredible. Okay. And if you, if you have thank you all. If, yeah. If you haven't settled up with your uh, waiter, please do so. Um, they're, is it 
we'll get them back in here if you haven't settled up. So thank you all for coming tonight. This is and Ron.